Good evening, lovely listeners, and welcome back to Raven Reads. I'm Raven, and this is the 18th installment in Night Marathon. For this video, I thought it would be fun to tell some stories that have to do with farms and ranches. I've always thought things like scarecrows and cornfields were supremely creepy, so I figured there had to be quite a lot of paranormal stories that had to do with these locations. As it turns out, I was right. I really hope you guys enjoy these stories. As always, links to merch, social media, and everything else will be in the video description. Be sure to like this video if you do, subscribe if you haven't already, and ring that bell so you don't miss a single one of the 90 videos coming to you during Night Marathon. And now, without further ado, you know what to do. Grab your gear, get a beverage of choice, get comfortable, and get ready to take another journey into the night. This takes place on our farm at night when I was 11 to 12. I farm, I always have, and I always will. But if you farm after dark, stuff gets scary. I've been farming since I was little, and I never really was afraid of the dark or any of those strange noises. But what happened that night still scares me to this day. I was probably 12 when this happened, and I'm 16 now. I was just getting done in one of our fields and was putting the tractor into the shed. It was probably around 9 o'clock by then, so it was pretty dark. I backed the tractor into the shed and shut it off. I got out of the tractor and shut the door. I walked down to the end of the shed to grab my phone charger and grabbed it. When I did, I heard a click and then a squeak of the tractor door opening. The hairs on my neck stood up because I knew that nobody was in this shed with me. There were no lights in the shed, only the light of the pole light outside. I pulled out my phone for light, and at the time I had a flip phone, but it was still bright enough to see a dark figure sitting in the tractor. I booked it out of that shed as fast as I could. To this day, I don't know what that dark figure was, and I'm still spooked about it. I really don't like farming alone at night anymore. When I was nine, my parents bought a derelict farm abandoned deep in the woods of Sweden. This isn't the first time my parents have done this. My parents had just sold the first farm after they made the farm livable. I was sad to part with it, but I looked forward to a whole new world of adventure and discoveries in the new farm. Nothing spooky ever really happened on the first farm. I was never afraid of the old house or the woods around it. I could be alone for hours in the woods, just playing and making dens for the picnics with my imaginary adventure team. Something changed, though, when we bought that second farm. The first couple of times we came to paint and build on the house, nothing happened. I was just exploring the different buildings and the woods around us. This farm had four buildings, the main house, the garage, a stable, and we never really found out what the fourth building was. It was badly damaged after it had burned down before we got there. I was really into horses and I used all of my time in the stable. We had owned the house for a year when something happened. I was in the stable playing with some hay when I suddenly felt like somebody had their hands around my neck, and then they squeezed. I couldn't breathe. I instantly ran out of the stable, and as soon as I saw my mom, I could breathe again, but I was coughing and wheezing, and I couldn't stop. I was trying to explain what happened, but my throat hurt so much that I just kept coughing. My mom rushed me inside the house and got some water. I was still coughing and gasping after 15 minutes, 
so my mom decided to drive me to the hospital while my dad stayed with my brothers. I eventually stopped coughing, of course, and nobody could ever really understand what had happened. Up until I was 14, I never had any allergies, and I had my first asthma attack when I was 13. The episode that I had was written off as an asthma attack, but looking back now and knowing what an actual asthma attack feels like, I call bullshit. After that whole thing, I stopped playing in the stable and opted for playing in the woods with my brothers. The next time something happened, I was 11. I had woken up in the middle of the night to hear somebody walking. I stood up from my bed and walked past my parents who were sleeping in the same room. I went to the kitchen and saw a black figure standing in the middle of the kitchen. Had I not noticed that I had walked past my dad to get there, I would have thought that it was him, but it wasn't. I was frozen, but something came over me, and I turned around and walked straight back to bed. I couldn't sleep though. I felt prickly eyes staring at me the whole night. I told my parents the next day that I saw a man in the kitchen, but they told me that I was probably dreaming. I probably was dreaming. But after seeing that figure, I always felt like I wasn't welcome and that I felt eyes on me all the time. One occurrence, though, left me terrified of the house and I begged my parents to leave me with my grandparents whenever they went to the farm. One day, I was on my computer chatting with some online friends and playing a game. My parents wanted to go grocery shopping and asked if I wanted to come too. I declined, being really into my game and they asked me if I was sure. I nodded, and they left with my brothers. I immediately regretted not going as soon as the door slammed shut. A feeling of terror came over me. I was scanning the whole room I was in, scared to find something that I shouldn't have. The car had already pulled onto the dirt road and out of sight by now. The sound of the car drifted away, and I was left in terror and silence. A silence that somehow grew louder and louder until it was deafening. I felt a pop in my ears. I was shaking and my teeth were chattering. And then I heard a tap, then another, and another. The taps were in a predictable rhythm. I knew it would be at least two hours until my family came home since the grocery store was miles away. I had to endure it but something sent me running out of the house. In the doorway to the kitchen, I saw a figure walking toward me. This time, I knew that this was no dream. My lungs felt like they were being crushed, and I began getting a headache. I stared at the figure for a good five seconds, and then in pure shock, I sprinted out the back door and toward the dirt road. I was thankful that I was still wearing my flip-flops after eating breakfast outside. I ran up the dirt road aiming to get help from the neighbors who lived a 20 minute walk away. I didn't expect to see our car coming down the road. I walked to the side of the road and my parents hopped out and asked what happened. I burst out crying so they put me in the car and I refused to go inside the house again. My parents thought that I made it all up and they told me that I was paranoid. I stand by what I saw. It's years later, and I still hate that farm. I've only visited once since then, but never again. Whatever was on that farm hated me. Me, specifically. But there's one other thing about that instance that bothers me. How long was I frozen in place? Like I said, it felt like only a few seconds. But it takes hours for us to go grocery shopping. And my parents didn't come back early. They had the groceries. I felt like what happened was maybe in a span of 5 to 10 minutes, but I had to have been sitting there for hours. Honestly, I don't even want to know. I'm just happy that I don't ever have to go back there again. This is a story that I have carried with me for the last 24 years. I haven't really spoken much about it since I was a child. You're free to not believe me. In fact, I encourage you to doubt anything that you're told from anybody. 
I'm writing this because as I've gotten older and I've spent over two decades developing a life to the best of my ability, I've carried an immense weight on my shoulders that nothing seems to alleviate, so I thought maybe telling my story would help. I am not from here, and by here, I don't mean where I currently live. I don't mean where any of us live. Anyone who is hearing this right now, it's now a few days after my 30th birthday, and this time of year always strikes me, because I started kindergarten on my birthday when I turned five. I thought, at the time, that everyone did that. You turned five, and when you turned five, you went to school. I didn't realize that my birthday just happened to coincide with the first day of school. A little over one year later, in about two weeks' time, it will have been 24 years to the day that my entire world vanished. I was born in San Diego, and I lived in a poorer suburb of San Diego as a child. I lived in an apartment complex called Lemon Vine Apartments. They were a bit slummier versions of the Lemon Vine Apartments found in Lemon Grove, which is a suburb of San Diego. My parents were divorced but friendly. My mother was young when she had me, and she was beautiful. She was in her early 20s and was aspiring to be a model. She would regularly take trips to LA to do photo shoots. She did glamour modeling for magazines. She had a darker skin tone, being one quarter Indian, and it gave her an exotic look. My favorite picture of her as a child was her modeling a luxurious wedding dress for a bridal company. I used to sleep with that picture when she would go to LA and I would stay with my dad who worked for the city of San Diego. They shared custody pretty evenly and we even did Christmas together as a family even though they had split when I was still a baby. My dad, his girlfriend, my mom who was single, and me. Maybe things weren't as good between them as I remember, but I was six. So if there was drama behind the scenes, they did a really good job of hiding it from me. On September 17th, 1996, I was staying with my dad's parents in Riverside, California. They had a small farm where they raised chickens, pigs, and goats. No horses or sheep or anything. But my grandma had several pet ducks that would eat from your hands, fly away, and return every year like clockwork. My dad had to work at night for a week and my mom was in LA, so I stayed with my grandparents. Schools back then were pretty cool with this kind of thing, and I was sent home with the sorts of nonsense assignments that you would expect of a first grader who had just gone back to school after summer break ended. The 17th was the third day that I was staying with my grandparents, and my grandpa had told me to be careful outside because he'd seen a rattlesnake and wasn't sure where it had gone. So, since nobody knew where the mystery snake had gone off to, six-year-old me decided to go hunting for it. In hindsight, letting a six-year-old go looking around a farm for a rattlesnake was probably not in any Parenting 101 handbook, but this was the 90s and I guess they didn't actually expect me to find it. There were woods on the property, but I wasn't allowed to go in there so they probably figured that's where the snake had gone off to. I spent all day outside playing jungle exploration on the farm, trying to track down this snake. And, much to my excitement, when I decided to open the well house, there it was. Curled up, rattling away. I immediately slammed the door shut and ran to my grandparents' house to tell them that I'd found it. Now, this might be my six-year-old memory exaggerating, but I'm pretty sure that snake was like 900 feet long, give or take. I found it though. I was excited to tell my grandpa that I had found it so he could do what he did, go out and shoot the thing. I ran in the back door of the house, which leads you into the laundry room and through the kitchen. I paid no mind to anything until I turned left and entered the living room expecting to see my grandparents, my uncle, and the neighbor couple, all sat in the living room where I'd left them. Except they weren't there, and it wasn't the same living room anymore. The furniture was completely wrong. The hard and memorably uncomfortable hardwood furniture my grandpa loved so much was gone. The coffee table that he had made out of a tree stump was gone. 
replaced by fluffy grandma-looking furniture. A three-person sofa with a floral design on it. The TV was in the wrong place. Newer than my grandpa's old sit-on-the-ground cabinet television. The hardwood paneling on the walls was gone, or at least covered by blue wallpaper. The hardwood floor was a shaggy off-white carpet. The pictures of my dad, my uncle, me, and my grandparents were gone from the walls, replaced by paintings and pictures of people I didn't know. As confused as I was by all of this, I was more confused by the fact that everybody was missing. In my six-year-old brain, I accepted that they may have completely rearranged the entire house while I'd spent the day looking for a snake, but I didn't believe at all that they would just leave me alone. I didn't see anybody leave. I didn't see the cars go down the road. So I walked out the front door, which was attached to the living room, as they usually are, and I thought that maybe they had gone to the chickens or the pigs. Both should have been clearly visible from the front porch, but the chicken coop was gone, and the pig pen had lost its fencing. There were no pigs to be found. At this point, I was beyond confused, and I was getting very scared. I didn't want to be alone, and I didn't see anybody. Even though they lived on a small farm, the neighbors that had been visiting lived just across the dirt road. So I ran down our dirt driveway and across the road to their house, assuming that must be where everybody had gone. I remember getting more and more scared as I ran to their house, and I remember starting to cry when their house was the wrong color. It wasn't the faded yellow house it used to be. It wasn't even the right house anymore, but nevertheless I banged on the door. I remember that at this point I was crying quite profusely because I didn't understand what was happening, and I kept wiping my face, which covered it in dirt after having been digging around under stumps and logs for snakes all day. When the door opened and a woman in her late 40s or early 50s answered, and I'd never seen her before, I just started bawling uncontrollably. Everything after this point is largely a blur because nothing was right. I knew where I lived. I knew where I went to school. I knew where my grandparents lived. But I met the people who lived where my grandparents lived, and they were not my grandparents. I didn't know them. I begged for them to get my uncle to tell them who I was, but my uncle wasn't there. Through a series of various police and people in suits, I was brought back to the town that I lived in after what seemed like 10 hours in the local police station trying to contact my parents. I had my home number memorized, but told them that my dad would be asleep. But when they called that number, the person on the other end had no idea who I was or what they were talking about. I was asked to give the police officers my address and I sat in the local police station while the police in my hometown went there. When they finally called the station back, they were informed that the name of the apartment building was incorrect. Lemon Vine Apartments didn't exist, and the address that I gave them was to an apartment complex called Merritt Manor. The apartment number that I had given them was unoccupied. I believe at this point they were operating under the assumption that I had given them the wrong name of the apartments and the wrong apartment number, but I did in fact live there. When I was finally brought to my hometown after changing hands a couple of times between police, I was asked to give the police officers my address again, and was driven to where I live. That was it. That was my apartment complex. But just like everything else, it looked wrong. It was painted a different color, and the sign that used to have a large image of a lemon reading Lemon Vine now read Merritt Manor. I took the police to exactly where I lived, and just as they had said, no one lived there. From this point forward, the police attempted to contact neighbors, all of whom knew me, but none of them were who they were supposed to be. Every person who came out of the apartment building was the wrong person and none of them knew who I was. From this point, they attempted to contact my father, which should have been easy. He worked for the city, but no employee by his name apparently worked there in any capacity. A day 
turned to night, and I spent endless hours sitting in the police station as they attempted to find any person in the world who knew me. I couldn't do anything but cry and cry, endlessly. A woman in a suit, who I think was either a detective or just somebody who happened to work there, sat with me for several hours and tried to keep me calm. She gave me a stuffed dog, a Dalmatian puppy, that looked a little bit like one of the dogs from 101 Dalmatians. She told me that his name was Sparky, and that I could keep Sparky, and that when they found my parents, Sparky would go home with me and make sure that I never got lost again. She said he was a good dog, and he would protect me if I took care of him. During this time, they attempted to contact my school. I told them I went to Shawnee Elementary. It was easy to find. It was really close to where I lived. But a school by such a name, as you might have guessed by now, didn't exist. My school was apparently called Anza Elementary. At one point, I was asked if the police had ever taken my fingerprints, and they had. In my kindergarten, my entire class had our fingerprints taken by the police at the school gym for basically exactly this reason. Unsurprisingly by now, this didn't help at all. They couldn't find my parents, my grandparents, my neighbors, my apartment, even me. They couldn't even find me. I was too young to remember what my social security number was, but I severely doubt that it would have mattered. They asked my birthday and any relevant information that could help them figure out who I was and where I belonged, but nothing that I told them turned up any information. At some point during the day, I was briefly taken to the ER, as the police suspected I may have sustained some kind of head injury. After being looked over by a doctor, of course, they found nothing wrong with me, and I was sent back to the police station. I ended up staying with somebody that night, but I'm not entirely sure who it was. Someone from child services, I imagine. I couldn't stop crying long enough to really focus on what was happening after this point. I had cried myself to sleep several times in the police station, and I cried myself asleep again at the house I stayed at that night. Despite the woman that I was staying with doing everything in her power to calm me, this was not the same woman who gave me Sparky. I clung to Sparky so hard I'm surprised I never popped his head off. I didn't have my picture of my mom, I didn't know what was going on, and nobody could find out where I belonged. This didn't make any sense to me. I was only six, and just barely. I lived where I lived, and my parents were my parents, and my school was my school, but they all just disappeared one day. But they couldn't have, right? In between fits of crying and waking up, I begged to go home. I begged for the lady I was staying with to try and call my dad again. I just kept begging to go back. Over the next few days, I was interrogated and questioned by different people at different times, at different places, at all hours of the day. Police, investigators, people from departments I still don't know the names of, child psychologists, everyone under the sun was asking me questions. I was back and forth between the police station and the house I was staying at, until eventually somebody told me that they thought they had located my parents and that they were coming to get me. Finally, I was going home. Finally, this was all going to be over. Finally, I could get away from these strange people asking me the same questions over and over. When the couple showed up at the police station, though, my heart fell into my feet, as these were not my parents. But they'd had a son that went missing and I fit his description pretty closely. The woman started crying when she saw me, though, because she immediately knew that I wasn't her missing son. I was out of tears to cry at this point. Eventually, I was collected by child services, and I was taken to a foster family where I stayed for a few months. The police launched a campaign, asking for anybody to come forward with information about me. They took my picture at the police station for the newspapers to put on the news. I never let go of Sparky, not even for a second. They didn't want me to hold him in the photo, because I didn't have him when I arrived. But I needed him, and I would throw an intense tantrum whenever somebody tried to take him away. They had me put back on the clothes I was wearing when they found me, but they had since given me new clothes to wear. 
In those months I spent at the foster home, parents of missing children would come to the house to see if I was theirs. I didn't realize that this is what was happening until I was older and looked back on it. They didn't just pull me out and say, is this your kid? They were a little bit more subtle about it. The parents would come to meet me, and upon realizing that I was not their missing child, they would often leave in tears. Looking back at all these families that came to see me in desperation that they were going to have their child back, I feel so horrible for them. It's a feeling I can't really explain. Almost like a type of guilt. Almost like I wish I had been their child so they could have them back and know they were safe. Most of those people probably never saw their children again, but I try and imagine that all of them were reunited, even though I know that isn't likely. This guilt was one of the things that kept me in therapy as an adult, but like I said, no therapist has ever bought my story or believed what I've said. The most common belief suggested to me has always been that I was abandoned as a child, I lived in an abusive home, I was dumped on the side of a dirt road in the middle of a farmland, and I repressed all the negative memories I had of my past. I didn't stay in that foster home permanently. Eventually, while my case wasn't officially closed, I needed to start going to school, and I needed identification. I was issued a birth certificate for the date that I told them was my birth year but the day and month were listed as September 17th, the day that I was found. I never understood why they didn't just use the day and month of my actual birth, but I imagine it was because they didn't actually think that I knew. My name was unchanged. I started going to school sporadically. One of the child psychologists who had seen me recommended that I not be placed back in full curriculum immediately and suspected that I suffered from some form of PTSD. I was put in the special class and was made to go to school twice a week initially. Eventually I started going to school full time and changed foster homes a few more times. I really can't say how much time passed before it happened, but eventually I was placed for adoption. I was never actually told that I was up for adoption, so I'm not sure how soon after found it was. But eventually people started coming to meet me, again. But these people weren't looking for a missing child, they were looking to adopt one. I definitely did not represent myself as a good candidate. I had a story that nobody believed and could verify, I insisted my parents would eventually find me, and I rarely had a day that I wasn't crying until my eyes burned. This story, sad to say, doesn't have a happy ending. I never saw my parents again, and I was a ward of the state until I was 18, and I went nowhere from there. My teens were filled with delinquency, and I did a brief stint in something similar to juvie that San Diego calls chaparral. I never went to college, and I never really started getting my life together until I was about 24. I've never publicly talked about this before, at least not since I was a child speaking to everybody who was trying to figure out where I came from. I still have Sparky. He's old and worn, still in one piece, but no longer white. He's now a dark shade of gray. He sits on my dresser and is there, just like he always has been, as long as I have been here, wherever here is. And this happened to me about 10 years ago, but it still sticks with me to this day. I was around 15 years old, and my mom and dad decided that we would take a trip to my aunt and uncle's new house that they had just bought in Gridley, Illinois, and stay for a few days. We lived in central Indiana, so it was about a three and a half hour drive to get there. The house was an old farmhouse, probably built in the early to mid 1900s, and sat very isolated, basically in the middle of a cornfield. I have a very large family, and a few more of my mom's siblings traveled to the house as well, so they were going to have a big party. My uncle, who owns the house, has a son who's about a year or two younger than me. We'll call him Steve. So my cousin Steve and I had been hanging out all night, playing video games, spending time with our families, and so on. Everyone was up fairly late, and as people started to go to bed, the party was dying down, and Steve and I decided to go to his room and crash for the night. Steve has a pretty small bedroom. I would say it's about 10 feet by 10 feet. 
but he did have bunk beds, so there was plenty of room for both of us to sleep in there. He normally slept on the bottom bunk, so I climbed up top to lay down for the night. As I did basically every night, I would pull out my phone and check MySpace or Facebook, whatever I was using at the time. I can't remember if MySpace was dead by then. So after laying there for about five minutes, Steve gets out of bed and said that he needed to use the restroom. The head of the bed is right next to the door. So I look down and I watch him leave the room and shut the door behind him. His room was basically pitch black dark, but there was some light from the hallway, so I clearly saw him leave. At this point, I'm laying on the top bunk in his room by myself in basically pitch darkness besides a light from my cell phone. He was gone for maybe a minute, when all of a sudden, the bunk bed starts slamming into the wall behind me, like there was somebody at the foot of the bed rocking the bunk back into the wall. As it's slamming into the wall, my first thought was that maybe one of Steve's older brothers was playing a prank or something. So I said, cut it out, that's not funny. The bed continues to slam into the wall. It did probably 10 times in total, about once every second or two. I waited for it to stop and I hopped down off the bunk to turn on the lights, expecting someone to be standing at the end of the bed laughing at me. I turned the lights on, but nothing. Nobody was in the room, just me. Like I said, it's a very small room and I made sure to check everywhere. Under the bed, in the closet, I was the only person there. At this point, I was completely terrified and I was trying to rationalize what had just happened. I decide maybe the bed is just rickety and somehow I was rocking it. I got to the foot of the bed and I tried to recreate what had happened. Not happening. This bed is one of those all-metal bunk beds bolted together, and it's not going anywhere. The only way to get that bed to move the way that it did would be to slide the entire bed back into the wall, slide it back, and repeat this motion. This thing was on carpet too, so it wasn't moving. I tried with all of my strength to mimic what I had felt, and I couldn't do it. At this point, I'm in total panic mode. I run out of the room, down the hallway to the bathroom, and I ask my cousin what the hell he was doing. He told me that he was going to the bathroom. I asked him if he was just in the room messing with me, and he asked me what I was talking about. I explained what happened, and once he was out of the bathroom, we went back to his room and talked about it. He said that he and his family have almost all had experiences of some kind in that house, paranormal in nature, since they moved in. Safe to say that night, I did not sleep in his room. I went and slept on the floor next to the bed where my parents were sleeping. This is the only time in my life that I have ever experienced anything paranormal, and that'll do for me.